Thanks so much, Joe, and, uh, and thanks to the, uh, the Institute for the opportunity to, uh, I suppose, give some, uh, some brief reflections on, um, on the outcome of, uh, of Lima from, a, from an Irish as well as from an EU uh, perspective, and also maybe to, uh, to look ahead to 2015, which, as Joe said, is a, is a, a milestone year, or hopefully will be when we look back at it, um, and, uh, and a, new, a new regime on the, on the climate side. Maybe just to, uh, to outline, I'm sure some of you uh, are probably wondering who's this kind of grey-haired, kind of bearded guy sitting here, kind of given that kind of the picture that was used uh, um, to, to advertise this uh, event uh, kind of uh, had a, a very sprightly young kind of uh, person. This is what two weeks of negotiations in, uh, in, in, in Lima does to you, so uh, grey hair and beard. And uh, I have been told by uh, some of my staff that... Uh, I shouldn't shave until we have a, a, a global agreement in December. So um, they didn't say which year. So I don't know kind of how long my beard will ultimately be. But listen, I just kind of, um, uh, I suppose there's a very kind of a diverse but a very august kind of group here. And uh, I, I know there'll be uh, as much value in, in listening to people's views and, uh, and understanding what people think uh, kind of has happened at Lima, what actually people expect will happen over the coming kind of months and where the priorities lie. So I, I do want to leave uh, a fair amount of time. And uh, I won't have all the answers. Um, indeed, kind of, uh, I rely kind of on, on experts for, for many of the detail uh, kind of issues. But certainly, there, there are plenty of people who have answers or views around the table uh, and around this room. So uh, I think kind of, uh, we will try and leave some, some, uh, some slots at the end to, uh, to have a dialogue, if that's all right. I might start with some, maybe some general feedback on, uh, on the outcome, uh, and I suppose to set the context for um, for how, how Lima went. Uh, I was there for, as Joe said, for, for, the, for the high level segment. And um, I think by the time I got there, maybe things were a little bit ropier at the start. But by the time I got there and we started the high level session, there was a, a general willingness uh, on the part of most parties to, to engage. Um, although, kind of, as always, there's a laborious process and you end up kind of having procedural wranglings in the early days as to how best to proceed and you waste days. But I think. What struck me uh, personally, and having kind of uh, attended now, that's my fourth kind of COP, is that for the first time I got a sense that parties were, were willing to actually engage on substance. They weren't just fighting about the process. They were actually e eager to argue their points, to outline why they wanted a particular option or a piece of language, and why they felt that they couldn't accept somebody else's. So that was good in, in, in a way that kind of people were now kind of moving into a, we need to find a solution here. But equally, kind of, uh, what happened was we had three full days of discussion on the co-chair's text for the ADP kind of decision, the Lima uh, kind of call to action. Um, and that text had originally been circulated as a six-page document. By the time we finished the three days of the initial discussion, it was actually a 72-page document. Um, and kind of that's, uh, I suppose, kind of part of the process. But it equally kind of highlighted to people that time was running out and decisions need to be taken. Um, but the fact that people were kind of you know, saying we like this but we don't like that, it kind of it felt that there was a slightly different dynamic in the room. I don't think we'll ever kind of come to a stage where all 193 countries will say, "This is great, we all agree on this." But I think there was a kind of a, a certain kind of within certain sectors and, and certain kind of uh, blocks, certainly a bit more of a of a proactive kind of feel. Um, and I think that kind of what we have at the end of of the Lima, the, the call for climate action is uh, an interesting kind of document. It's kind of, uh, it does, uh, I suppose it does present a compromised view across the range of, uh, of, of desires and wishes, but it also outlines particularly some key kind of details on the process and the elements of what we do need to do during the early part of 2013 and indeed how we're going to get ultimately to Paris uh, at the end of uh, November and early December. Um, it is, I suppose, the decision itself is a mix of the bottom-up approach where kind of we have these INDCs uh, and uh, uh, these in intended nationally determined contributions, um, which would be, I suppose, nationally proposed, but then having some form of collective assessment or analysis or indeed consideration uh, to, to try and kind of balance, uh, I suppose, to, to compare the apples and oranges that are presented in a way that can assess are we collectively doing enough or not to... Uh, uh, to, to mitigate and, and, and to turn the tide on, on, on the, uh, the climate kind of uh, overheating. Um, but I think equally what we've come away with, and I think the, the, uh, the coverage and indeed kind of views of, of various parties in the media, uh, we still flag that there's a huge number of kind of key issues that need to be addressed in terms of the legal status of the agreement itself, 
obviously the EU and, and, uh, and some of the more progressive countries are looking for a legally binding document um, that actually has, I suppose, uh, full legal force, whereas other countries, uh, say the US uh, and, and uh, maybe Australia, would be looking at more looser agreements that you would have voluntary elements that you could kind of uh, deal with that in the US case wouldn't require them going to the Senate uh, to basically get a, get a, a legal resolution. Uh, then you have issues around the scale of the, of, the, of the peer review itself, how much kind of uh, countries are willing to offer up their, their targets or their draft targets um, as kind of um, as fodder for countries to pick apart and saying, are you doing enough, are you not doing enough? And this is maybe where the developing countries like uh, China, like India, indeed like kind of Russia and, and some of the larger kind of ones would be concerned that they're ceding some of their, their national sovereignty um, and also, I suppose, linked to the whole issue of peer review is how you deal with the issue of common accounting and the fact that if you are kind of bringing so many different um, elements of targets and objectives, uh, whether they're kind of base years or, or kind of uh, or national kind of targets or kind of scale down, how do you compare them? And are we all working to the same so that we understand that we're doing more, we're doing less, or that we can do more? Uh, and, and that's an issue that I suppose is still to be resolved even in principle, if we don't get into the detail by, by Paris. And then the last issue, maybe more for developing countries, uh, was very much around the issue of uh, the links between finance and, and the development uh, and, and accepting targets uh, and actions from themselves. Um, and obviously, kind of, not only is it that they will only do kind of, uh, some of their works if they feel that there is kind of sufficient support, whether it's financial or technical or capacity building support, but equally, that finance uh, contributions from developed countries needs to be part of their national or their kind of international targets. So there, I suppose, kind of, uh, while we do get an agreement out of, uh, out of Lima, there are a huge number of issues that, I suppose, have been kicked down kind of, uh, to further discussions. Um, and, you know, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done, kind of uh, starting with uh, the next session in, in, in February in Geneva. I think... You know, time is always a, a kind of of essence in terms of trying to, to get through all the work. And one of the pieces of work that we only really had a chance to, to have one read through, and it, it was annexed to the, the Lima decision, was this elements of a draft negotiating text. And a bit like the previous document that, uh, that grew from a six-pager to 70-odd pages, um, this draft kind of includes a whole list of, uh, of options um, you know, and many of them at, at the polar ends of the, uh, of, of the spectrum. And, you know, if we had an extra week, we may or may not have had a chance to, uh, to, to resolve them. But I think even getting a, an agreed decision and deferring some of those issues, but recognizing that this document is at least uh, a useful starting point, if it's accepted by all parties in, in, in February, to, to move ahead and start working out, well, what will actually be in this final agreement uh, at the end of the year? Um, and that actually kind of is, I suppose, a major task, and the proof will be in the pudding as to whether that work begins in earnest or whether we go back to procedural wrangling for the first few days of, of, of the Geneva conference. Uh, I think there's general kind of views, and certainly the EU and, and uh, Minister White and, and, and myself, we were very, very impressed with the, the Lima, the COP president himself, uh, Minister for the Environment, uh, Manuel Pul, Pulgar Vidal, um, who kind of has a... Uh, I suppose a very personal interest in it in that he, was a, he is an environmental lawyer. Um, he actually attended the, the Rio conference back in 92 as an NGO. So he's been involved for 20 odd years um, in, kind of a, in kind of in different aspects of the environment. And you could see from his engagement that number one, he was very committed to a decision. But number two, he understood a lot of the issues. And it was nice to, I suppose, to see the difference from the previous COP presidency where uh, or presidencies where you might have had maybe more national or, or particular interests that were overriding kind of uh, a consensus decision. Uh, and I think that certainly in the, in the final, final day and, and hours of the, of the conference, his role was critical in bringing some of the parties together and finding a compromise. Um, equally, the, the work uh, by the two co-chairs, um, the, the, it was the EU Commission person, Artur Rungermetze, and uh, the Trinidad and Tobago kind of representative from Gulak, uh, Kishan Kumar Singh, they were finishing their, this was their last event, and they'd been guiding this process for 18 months, and, um, you know, they, they kind of piloted very choppy waters and, and, and tough days, particularly in the early kind of uh, part of, of both the bond session back in June and indeed the first week here, 
but they came out with a very good kind of a conclusion and handed over their uh, handed over the reins of the of the ADP for the final year to uh, the American delegate now Daniel Reichschneider, uh, Reichschneider, and uh, and uh, the delegate from Algeria representing the Africa group, whose name is Ahmed Jokaf. Um, I haven't learned that one off yet, but I'm sure we'll have to kind of uh, address the co-chair kind of uh, at future at future sessions. That's a big job, and I suppose the EU itself was quite was was kind of quite um, realistic in recognising that as COP presidency kind of uh, will be actually in, in France, you know, it's it's not appropriate for the EU to actually have the uh, the co-chairing role in the run-up to the the conference. But uh, there is hope that. You know, given the precedent of uh, of both the the outgoing co-chairs and indeed the previous co-chairs who did a very good job, they've been able to leave behind their national and maybe their kind of their regional interests uh, in uh, in the in the interest of, of bringing kind of all the parties together. So the bar is set pretty high for these two new co-chairs, but we shall see how they um, how they get on. And their first job, of course, be in in a few weeks' time. From the from the Irish delegation, um, we kind of. Uh, the department uh, leads on, 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 on the climate change and coordinates, but we rely on a huge number of people around, uh, around the system um, from kind of both agencies and, and central departments. So we had kind of colleagues from agriculture, from the EPA, uh, from Irish Aid, uh, and indeed from, from the Department of Finance who were actually on the ground in Lima, and, and uh, we had a, a huge number of, of others who were on hand to, to feedback comments. And I suppose it's kind of a, maybe just a, a chance for me to uh, and the department to acknowledge the uh, the great work and the commitment that is uh, is given by all these agencies that offer up kind of two and a half weeks of their time plus all the preparation in terms of contributing their expertise to uh, a fairly kind of tiring and, and, and laborious process oftentimes. But I think it certainly has helped that building on the work we had during our, our EU presidency where we, we had some very kind of... Uh, central role in the negotiations and in some of the brokering of deals, um, we've, we've tried to maintain that and have kept kind of quite a few, I suppose, important coordinating roles, um, both within the EU and indeed in, so in some of the, uh, the sidebar discussions as co-chairs and co-facilitators. So I think that um, it's just maybe just take the opportunity to, to acknowledge that, that great work and to make sure that they keep it up for the next 12 months or we'll, uh, we'll all be left kind of, uh, kind of, kind of holding kind of, uh, our, our hands and nothing in them. And I think as well, kind of, uh, you probably are aware that Minister White um, very ably deputised for, for Minister Kelly, who I think had more pressing domestic matters uh, to manage uh, during December. Uh, but uh, I, I, I know from, from talking to, to Minister White and indeed to his staff that he found it very, very useful and it was particularly strategic in the context of his own department's work on their, their green paper and energy um, which is obviously kind of uh, being kind of advanced now, and we're moving into the uh, towards the white paper stage. And I think you know not only from a, an energy perspective, but e understanding the international context. I think oftentimes on um, one of the values of having a kind of a, a, the climate brief is that you're not just kind of dealing with the national side or with the EU, but you actually have the the international context. And I think that's something that uh, that Minister White will will take to heart when he is kind of looking at his own kind of department's role not only within the climate side, but looking at kind of uh, the energy portfolio that he has. So um, I think we'll kind of, we'll certainly look to maintain that kind of, uh, that engagement and, uh, and, and build on it in 2015. Maybe just before I get into the detail, just the mood leaving kind of Lima, kind of were people happy, were they not happy? Um, it really depends on your perspective. Uh, are you a glass half full or are you a glass half empty? Um, I think certainly um, the, the signs of a successful kind of uh, outcome to a conference is that nobody is happy uh, entirely. Um, but I think from the, maybe from the EU perspective, um, I think that there was, I suppose, a sense that you know, some progress was made, not as much as we would have liked and with not as much detail as we would have liked. Um, but at the same time, we did get a decision which was looking kind of highly unlikely in the maybe 18 hours to go before the... Uh, the end of the of the of the conference, and um, there's enough there for us to actually build on the work that needs to happen now in the in the early part of, of 2015. But fully kind of recognise that you know you're looking at kind of other aspects um, that that didn't really deliver kind of uh, to the full extent. And I think that kind of um, uh, you know people can all point to three or four things that they would like to see either in the in the process or on the on the worksheet for uh, for early 2015. Maybe kind of 
uh, I don't know whether it's kind of one outcome from the, uh, from the conference uh, and, the, and the decision, and you could look at it as a, as a good or bad kind of uh, outcome, is that Lima, with all its kind of momentum, so you had kind of the UN Secretary General Summit, you had the UN, US-China conference and uh, detente in November, you had the EU's 2030 kind of headline decisions, and with, uh, I suppose, a very kind of experienced and a very proactive COP president, we still barely got over the line. And I think people were going back with maybe a heightened realism about what is going to be achieved in Paris um, and, and, and what can be achieved in Paris. Um, and I think it does pose quite a few very tricky questions, uh, which I, I don't have the answers to, and indeed kind of, uh, I'm sure they'll be kind of part of the debate uh, between now and, and, and December, is that really kind of what do we actually expect out of Paris? Do we, do we want or do we kind of, uh, would we be happier with a weak deal that all parties sign up to um, uh, or a strong deal that some parties reject and therefore stay out of the process? Um, how do we deal with the issues uh, and the likely, the very likely shortfall between what parties are prepared to actually uh, contribute as, as, their, as their target uh, towards kind of uh, global greenhouse gas reductions? and what we know from the science is actually needed. How do we deal with that? And then the other challenge is, given that we are looking to agree a decision in 2015 that will only have legal effect from 2020, what are the risks of locking in low ambition now, kind of till 2025 or 2030? And I suppose these are all issues that we're aware of and uh, indeed will kind of probably further emerge uh, during the year, but I think you know, at a, at a national, indeed at an EU level, uh, these are kind of our issues that are likely to come back to the fore, kind of both at, at ministerial as well as at official level. And as I said, you know, people may have views kind of around the table here and maybe kind of uh, I'd welcome any kind of uh, views on those. I think kind of maybe looking at, at, I've talked about the EU perspective and I mentioned to, to, to Joe and, uh, and, and to Tom before that it was the first time I was actually at um, a COP where the EU seriously considered walking away from a decision and saying, we're not going to accept this. Uh, there was, I suppose, the EU is traditionally seen as the, uh, the party that kind of goes out there and says we can do whatever and pushes everybody and yet concedes on a number of key issues. And I suppose we were getting to a point where there was a risk that um, the decision text we've come back with from Lima would actually be so restrictive or so kind of, um, or so weak that in fact would be better off having no decision from Lima and actually kind of pushing ahead rather than locking ourselves into something. And, and maybe just to give you an example, one of the issues uh, that was potentially on the table was that parties would put forward their proposed INDCs um, between June and you know, towards the end of the year, but we wouldn't have any analysis or kind of discussion on them until 2016 which would mean we'd be signing up to an agreement in Paris without any chance to actually kind of articulate and have a, a rational discussion on how we account for them, how we kind of assess them. And that was a, a red line to the EU, and kind of a, uh, we gave very strong instructions to both our lead negotiators and indeed to, to Commissioner Cagnetti um, that you know, that was something that we just could not countenance from a, an environmental as well as from a, from a policy perspective. And I think the other, I suppose, big issue was... Um, I think looking at kind of, you know, what level of detail and what would be kind of included or not. At the end of the day, I think, as I said, we can work with, with the decision we have, but, you know, there are a huge number of risks throughout the, uh, uh, the process and, and throughout kind of uh, all these milestones where parties, if they don't want to step up and don't step up quick enough, you know, we will be left kind of scrambling towards the end. And, you know, more than once during the conference, people talked about another Copenhagen and another kind of... Uh, uh, another kind of, so can we learn the lessons? Can we kind of at least try and uh, front load what we're kind of doing? Um, in terms of other blocks, and maybe kind of, I'm sure uh, you've probably kind of seen different media coverage and indeed kind of different uh, reports back from, from different areas. And the China and the US, obviously they're, they're huge players and will be the kind of uh, the key players in kind of any final decision. Some of the, the good feeling that they had from their November detente, I think was dampened and... Uh, you know, I'm not saying that they kind of actively kind of uh, retrench themselves, but I think that, you know, they kind of, they realize that what they thought was a great thing for themselves 
people started to pick holes and ask questions and they didn't really have the answers. But the fact that they're still at the table and I suppose they've still signaled that this is an important issue nationally as well as internationally for them uh, is an important kind of consideration. Um, South Africa and Brazil, I suppose, as part of the, the basic group, um, you know, they were, I think there was a sense that they were a bit more cooperative than previously, um, and perhaps that was partly because Brazil uh, had the continental link and didn't want to be kind of overly uh, scuppering their, uh, their Peruvian hosts. But equally, I think they were looking at solutions and the Brazilian concept of this concentric circles of people moving, moving into the circle and, and committing to more as their resources and uh, capacity allows. And indeed, South Africa is looking to broker deals. You know, I think that was actually a, a strong signal and maybe there was a little bit of a, a broken link between the basic countries. So India and China are kind of a bit more kind of uh, isolated where South Africa and Brazil are, are kind of... There was no statements that I heard that actually included kind of basic statements. So um, it was a, just an interesting geopolitical kind of uh, observation to make. One group that did actually come to the fore was this group called the Like-Minded Group. Now... Um, if anybody can actually kind of put a number or kind of list every single country that, that tends to hop in and out of the group, um, they'll be doing very well. They can range from between 24 and 40, 45 countries, but they're generally countries, developing, developing countries um, that would be uh, very much protective of the firewall, uh, very much kind of pushing for developed countries to take kind of a, a huge amount of, of action and, and commit significant resources before... Uh, developing countries can be expected to, to take action. And they certainly flexed their muscles. They used the G77 discord and I suppose the, the lack of coordination um, to maybe fill that gap. So sometimes you'd have China in there, sometimes you'd have India and, you know, but they wouldn't obviously list, they've, they've stopped listing who the countries are. So it's even, it's even more difficult to work out who they're speaking on behalf of. But Malaysia is actually their spokesman at the moment and he's a very uh, seasoned um, uh, political kind of and indeed kind of a diplomatic campaigner and he was uh, he was ruining the fact that he was missing his flight in the last hours to a very kind of expensive trip to Machu Picchu and he was sitting in the conference room kind of looking for a solution but telling everyone how much he was missing kind of uh, uh, his fun times uh, but he was willing to do it for the sake of the planet um, but actually I think one of the things that might have kind of uh, slightly irked a number of other developing countries, but they, they tried to take a lot of the credit, both from the COP presidency and indeed from the likes of EOSIS and the LDCs, about what they were delivering and what they were leveraging from developed countries. Um, now, as to what that kind of uh, means as we move into 2015, but just um, I think one of his final statements was that it was great that um, this Lima decision finally brought all the developing countries back into the one fold. Um, now, kind of, uh, I think that was more wishful thinking from his part, but uh, it's just a signal that they see this as kind of safety in numbers, keep everybody kind of, uh, keep the divide between developed and developing countries, because I think as we get closer to Paris, there's a recognition that the least developed countries, um, certainly AOSIS, the uh, associate of, of uh, Latin American states, there'll be a block that will be emerging from the developing countries. They'll be looking for a deal, and the EU will obviously be kind of trying to, I suppose, further further develop those relations so that we don't have this very clear developed versus developing uh, country fight when it comes to Paris. Um, and then just uh, the last group, I suppose, Africa and kind of the LDCs were, were very much to the fore, very strong, I suppose, on early action, again, highlighting the kind of uh, the one and a half degree goal rather than the two degree goal. Climate finance was a huge issue. And also, I think, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a huge impetus there and a huge requirement for the EU to look very, very closely at of what we can do to assist them because, uh, as most of you know, most of uh, AOSIS members and the LDCs are at the coalface and they're actually feeling the heat of, uh, of climate change and the impacts right now. Um, and, you know, kind of, I suppose that there's, a, there's a moral onus as well as a, a political onus on us to, to look at how we can assist them in also framing kind of a, an agreement that actually has, has uh, not only legally binding force but actually has a clear effect uh, in, in, in mitigating and adapting to, uh, to climate change. I don't know whether we want to go into kind of a huge amount of the detail on, on the decisions itself, but I think that there was, I suppose, a few issues that I might just highlight, um, and we can go into if people kind of want to go into the detail. I have, um, I have some kind of, uh, have the decision here, and we can kind of, we can parse the, the language. But I think a few things just um, in terms of the compromises. There was a reference in the last hours um, kind of inserted about adaptation and trying to actually put the, the balance 
uh, most of the, uh, the targets that were being kind of, I suppose, described as, as national kind of INDCs um, was very much on the mitigation side. And I think uh, um, recognizing the, the key pressures that uh, uh, the developing countries were feeling that they wanted adaptation listed as a key consideration so that when you're putting forward your INDC, it doesn't, it isn't solely about, or doesn't have to be solely about reducing the amount of your uh, uh, emissions, but can be a combination of reducing your emissions but also kind of taking steps and investing to actually mitigate, to, 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 uh, to adapt to kind of what are kind of likely impacts of climate change in the future years. And that was actually, I think, something that we recognize. The question is how it will actually kind of be accounted for, and that's maybe the, back to the issue of the, having the MRV and accounting rules. Um, there was also a kind of a clear push from AOSIS to look at loss and damage and to give a reference. Now, it's actually included in the preambular kind of paragraphs to the decision. Uh, and it's very much in the context of the Warsaw International Mechanism. So, um, you know, a number of countries were very eager to kind of to tie in loss and damage, which, you know, basically means compensation for 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 kind of impacts of climate change into the actual new agreement. But it was it's referenced in the decision, but very much so in the context of the work that's already there and the structures that are in place. And then maybe the most significant concession um, that was secured by developing countries and and and, and a few others was a reference, the explicit reference to uh, this delightful phrase, common but differentiated principles and respective capabilities. Uh, the CBDR or C um, has been a principle of the convention from, from back in the day. And the fact that we actually kind of cited it as uh, a particular element within, uh, albeit the preambular kind of a piece of the, of the, of the decision, um, it's actually a significant that this pretty much kind of recognizes that Countries have different responsibilities and therefore need to take different steps. But how it's interpreted is, is that there's a firewall. So you go back to 1992 and you say, well, there's so many countries who are developed, uh, a small number, whatever it is, 47, 48, and then the rest of them are all developing countries, and, they, and never, never the twain shall meet. Um, the difficulty is 20, 22, 25 years ago, you could argue that China and Brazil and you know, a lot of countries uh, were kind of certainly in that stage, but now they're kind of they're global kind of uh, economic powerhouses, and more importantly, they're global emitters. Uh, and how do you actually kind of get their kind of their mindset to change? And how kind of we reflected in the in the decision was we actually used some language um, that had been agreed previously by China and the U.S., which probably represent the the uh, the poles of the spectrum in terms of what they're looking for. And the the qualifying language we used was. Um, referencing CBD or kind of or C, but in light of different national circumstances, and I think from a purely legal perspective, <coughs> there is a sense, and you can argue this kind of uh, in court or whatever, but kind of uh, politically, there's a sense that that actually allows for, I suppose, a more nuanced approach to maybe have countries kind of saying, well, you know, as things change, maybe we need to change. Um, so, and this whole issue of differentiation. So that was a concession that was kind of given in the final hours. And, uh, you know, I know some parties like the US and Australia felt it was a concession that was given far too soon, but kind of uh, in terms of actually getting a decision, the issue of CBDR and RC was going to be on the table anyway. It's, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference whether it's, it's cited in the decision or whether it's kind of used um, and cited from the principles of the convention itself. Um, just one kind of uh, one last thing about the the kind of what the EU was looking for and, and what it might uh, might not have got. There was a paragraph. It's paragraph 14 of the decision, and it talks about this upfront information. What information will countries actually give when they're presenting their IDC, uh, INDCs? And a little bit more detail was actually inserted in that, which was helpful from from an EU perspective. It basically allows for a longer list of of items that needs to be, I suppose, considered and 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 added to as you're kind of producing your INDC. And there was, a, there was an inclusion of, of one word called quantifiable, uh, which wasn't there before, um, and which I think will help to make the aggregate kind of accounting a little bit easier because you're going to have to put a figure at the end of it, or at least be able to kind of turn a principle into well, what this might mean. Um, but one of the things that did drop from the final decision was we had planned or we had hoped in the middle of the year that there would be a, a, a process, whether we call it a meeting or whether we call it just uh, one of the uh, part of the sessions we had, where we would have a dialogue 
with countries that have put forward their targets and allow other countries to say, well, why did you do that? Or kind of, is that all you can do? Or what's that going to deliver? Um, that kind of dialogue, which was supposed to be constructive dialogue, um, it suddenly became uh, non-invasive and, um, you know, kind of, you know, the most bland kind of descriptions you could, you could imagine. Um, and, you know, the fact that we'd have a, a session where you wouldn't be kind of allowed to ask any hard questions. Kind of, we said, well, at least we have a session. And then they decided that they were going to move that to 2016. So we weren't going to have this discussion to 2016. And the EU decided that, well, you know, that was a step too far. And we'd rather actually remove any reference to this, this session. Um, because in reality, we all know that as soon as people put them out there, there'll be analysis that will be done. And there'll be a dialogue, whether it's in a formal session or whether it's just bilaterals. So uh, we didn't want to have any restrictions on what kind of uh, could be discussed or how it could be discussed during, 2016, during 2015 itself. And the other kind of maybe slight nuance was that there was going to be, from the Secretariat, uh, what they kind of called a technical paper that was just compiling them. So basically, all these INDCs, you basically put them all into one document and circulate it to everybody. Um, what that has now been upgraded to a synthesis report on the aggregate effects of the INDCs. So a little bit more analysis and an attempt to, to try and kind of convert the apples and oranges into uh, collective fruit, uh, so to speak. Um, now, the danger is that, that that actually document is not due until November, which leaves it very, very late. But there'll be, as I said, there'll be a lot of dialogue between kind of, um, I suppose, June and, and November anyway. Um, so I suspect that, you know, kind of that, re that report will just enhance the discussion we're already having in uh, uh, throughout the year. Um, in terms of and before I kind of just, I suppose, leave, and I'm conscious I want to leave as much time as possible, there were obviously a huge amount of other things that were happening. Kind of these cops, kind of, they tend to focus on the, the highly political issues, but there was a significant amount of work done in relation to um, presentation of, of what we call kind of the, um, our multilateral assessments. So countries actually, including the EU and a number of member states, presented to the COP kind of what they're doing in terms of their biennial reporting, what, what measures they're taking and policies they're, they're delivering. And that was actually, I suppose, a very useful exercise to demonstrate to other countries that MRV is actually useful, that you can actually report, you can measure, and you can verify, and then you can kind of, I suppose, argue um, kind of why your policies are, are, are working or not. Um, and Ireland, actually, just to, to flag Ireland, will be actually making its presentation at the, uh, the forthcoming June session in Bonn um, under the SBI kind of heading. There was also, obviously, a recognition of the science uh, and the, uh, the fifth assessment report, and that was very much kind of, I suppose, fully recognized and included in a lot of the discussions. So, uh, and indeed through the uh, structured expert dialogue, which, which dealt with the issues. But I think as we get closer and closer to, to Paris, I think people are arguing less about the science and more about what's practical and what's reasonable and affordable, uh, which I suppose is one, is one kind of a facet to the, uh, to the battle that kind of uh, we might be kind of uh, at least kind of able to take a, a bit of a breather from as long as we don't lose sight of what are the ultimate scientific and, uh, uh, and, and requirements to, to deliver on, 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 the, uh, on the actions. And obviously finance is another issue. There was quite a few um, acknowledgements of the, the kind of uh, contributions pledged to the Green Climate Fund. Um, and in the end, actually, I think uh, just over 10.2 billion US dollars was, um, was pledged both in advance of and during the conference itself. Um, as Minister White kind of indicated in his, his address, the plenary Ireland, along with a number of other countries, um, were unable to actually kind of contribute or, or make their pledge at the conference itself. But kind of in terms of, of future climate finance, uh, we, we do expect to be able to have matched our fast start finance kind of from, from previous years. And indeed, in 2013, I think we kind of... Uh, we spent about 34 million in 100% uh, generally adaptation grants to least developed countries and our program countries. We hope to match that in 2014, and indeed, kind of uh, the government, um, not only kind of Minister White and, and myself, but indeed the entire government is looking at how to actually, uh, I suppose, look at all options for for mobilising and scaling up climate finance, including to the GCF itself. I kind of, I have other bits and pieces there, but I kind of, we can, I'm sure we can catch those in, uh, in our discussion. I suppose just to flag where we go next in milestones, most of you are probably aware of the, the key steps. There are kind of um, on the 8th to the 13th of February, there's a, a week-long session focused solely on the ADP and the negotiations for the 2015 agreement in Geneva. We have our annual 
uh, summer jaunt to, uh, to Bonn, where we kind of spent kind of uh, two weeks uh, and hopefully we'll kind of uh, we'll get beyond kind of procedural kind of fights and, and get stuck into uh, the clear work that's needed. And then kind of we have the COP kind of uh, starting on the, 20, the 30th of November um, in Paris, I think based in Le Bourget uh, at the airport. Um, I had actually some initial discussions with the French um, delegation at, at Lima and indeed kind of uh, met further with, uh, with the ambassador since I, I came back here. They're obviously very eager to mobilize they are reluctant to, to signal any kind of additional sessions because as soon as you signal an additional session, nobody does any work at the previous sessions. Uh, so I think that they, uh, they do intend to try and kind of, as far as possible, keep to those three weeks, uh, those, th those, those three sessions. Um, but they also recognize that kind of, uh, as needs must, they want to try and build momentum. And I think certainly learning from this year's event where you had Ban Ki-moon kind of uh, bringing in heads of state, I wouldn't be surprised if you know, with the year that's in it. We have a, another kind of similar model, maybe, maybe based around the SDG kind of uh, culmination of the process at the end of uh, September in, in New York. So there's a huge amount of work to be done, but um, hopefully that gives you a flavor uh, from the, uh, the grand forces, so to speak, uh, but happy to take any questions, but equally I'd be very interested to hear views from, uh, from yourselves as to what was the perspective.